Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Population Genomic Screening, the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative. It is presented by Bruce R. Korf, MD, PhD. Dr. Korf is a professor of genetics and chief genomics officer at UAB Medicine. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the Promotional Board at the bottom center of your screen. Or use the Ask a Question box to let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Korf. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to describe the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative, a project that we have been working on over about the past year and a half um, here at uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham and with our collaborators at Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. The overall objectives of the project are, first of all, to determine whether genomic screening can be deployed on a population-wide basis, to ask the question, how can we return results, I mean by that, um, medically important results to participants, to better understand what the community expects from participation in such an endeavor, and finally, to look at the outcomes. Um, how can we measure whether we are actually um, providing a service that's um, both needed and appreciated? Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, the project is a collaboration between UAB Medicine and Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology in Huntsville, Alabama. It was funded by $2 million allocations in fiscal year 17 and 18 um, in each year and we're hoping that this will be a five-year project that will be funded by the state. The overall goal is to provide genomic analysis for about 10,000 citizens of the state of Alabama over a five-year span to return specific clinical data, which I'll describe in some detail, and also to maintain both a research database and a biobank. As the project began to come together, which was in um, about October of um, 2016, the um, first steps were to establish an oversight committee. And um, this includes leaders both at UAB and at Hudson Alpha. The principal investigators besides myself are Greg Barsh at Hudson Alpha and Matt Might at UAB. And then we established these five working groups, one on bioethics intended to guide us in terms of ethical, legal, and social implications of the project, and also in the formation of the informed consent process and the IRB protocol. A data and bioinformatics working group to focus on data management, the sample preparation, biobanking, and overall support of research applications of the data an education working group to provide resources for participant education and outreach, genetic counseling of individuals who receive medically important results and how these are communicated both to the participants and to providers, in addition also a CME program for providers. A genomics working group that has really set the paradigm for us both in genotyping and sequencing and also to do the annotation of results that will be returning to participants. And finally, a participant and provider engagement working group 
intended to provide uh, recruitment and engagement activities, as well as outreach into the community. I guess one fundamental question is, is why do this? Um, what is, if you will, the value proposition to the various stakeholders? Well, for the participants, we are returning results of the 59, currently 59 genes, on the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics list that was developed actually for secondary findings, and I'll go into more detail about that in a few minutes. And also, there is a group where we're um, doing sequencing to achieve a diagnosis to end the diagnostic odyssey, as it's called, uh, for those who have undiagnosed phenotypes. So we believe there is a return of value to participants. From the perspective of health providers, this is an opportunity to educate them about the application of genomic medicine in their practice, and also to provide support for their patients who actually have findings. For the research community, it provides access to both genotypic and linked medical information to get a snapshot of genomic data for the Alabama population, and to also provide a platform for research on ethical, legal, and social issues just the process of engagement of the community. And finally, from the perspective of the state, we aim to provide a kind of genomics ready population and healthcare workforce. There is a um, potential for economic development based on this activity and providing a sort of cutting edge um, perception um, for the interest and readiness of the state uh, to be a player in the area of genomic medicine. Well, this is a complicated timeline that covers from when the project was funded in October of 2016 over its first year as we were getting the infrastructure in place. I'm not going to go into um, detail here. Probably the main point of this slide is um, to highlight how many moving parts there are to this, um, ranging from town hall meetings to get input from the community about the most appropriate way to proceed uh, to shepherding the protocol through the UAB IRB so that we were approved to proceed with the project. Um, there was a press conference, a uh, snapshot of which is shown at the upper left. And um, we actually began pilot enrollment in May of 2017, um, deliberately paused for a month or so just to make sure that our workflows were going as they should and began kind of full recruitment in July of 2017, and that's been going on ever since. Now, two separate cohorts are being recruited for participation in this study. We call them the population cohort and the affected cohort. Now, the population cohort are adults not selected for any particular medical problems. Literally, this is any adult who is able to give consent, they need to be an Alabama resident, given that that's where the support is coming from. Uh, but we're not targeting any particular kind of medical situation. So really just any adult willing. The affected cohort, in contrast, are individuals who have a phenotype that suggests the possibility of a genetic etiology that has been resistant to standard diagnostic testing. Individuals in the population cohort have genotyping done using the Illumina Global Screening Array, about which I'll say more in just a moment. Variant analysis is done, and there is a um, return of results of so-called medically actionable variants. I'll return to that point also in just a moment. These are verified by Sanger sequencing in a CLIA-certified laboratory. Then genetic counseling is provided to the participants found to have pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in this list of genes. And then we help to connect them to supportive care. Individuals in the affected cohort have whole genome sequencing done at Hudson Alpha. The goal is to identify pathogenic variants. In fact, we return pathogenic, likely pathogenic, and we will return variants of unknown significance that have at least a plausible link to the disorder, recognizing, of course, that those are not verified as being pathogenic. 
and similar, similarly provide genetic counseling and supportive care. Meanwhile, DNA is saved in a tissue bank as well as, well as um, blood samples. Uh, we also maintain a genomic database, um, all with an opt-in consent, I might add, and medical record information is linked through I2B2. So the mainstay of genotyping is the Illumina Global Screening Array, which includes somewhere in the range of 600,000 single nucleotide variants. Um, it covers um, relatively common variants as well as um, enrichment for variants identified in ClinVar as being pathogenic responsible for Mendelian disorders. We're estimating something close to 50% of the ACMG 59 list that I'll show you in just a few moments are identified by this approach, but we certainly also understand that at least 50% are not identified, an important point we'll return to. There are some pharmacogenomic variants that are included, and we may eventually return these, although for this point in time, we're only returning genes on the ACMG 59 list. The whole genome sequencing is done um, at Hudson Alpha um, with 30x mean coverage, and um, there is an option to return incidental findings if the, um, the participants choose to have that information. This is a list of the 59 genes on the ACMG list that is probably familiar to most people. Now, it needs to be remembered that this list was actually put together in the context of clinical sequencing. And the, the kind of fundamental principle here was that if you're doing clinical sequencing, uh, these are genes that are associated with high penetrance, so-called medically actionable disorders, which means these are disorders where if a pathogenic variant is found in a gene, that there is a high probability of developing a significant phenotype that is amenable to intervention to achieve a better outcome than if an individual had waited to develop signs and symptoms that would have led to a diagnosis. There are these 59 genes, obviously multiple variants that are pathogenic, um, more likely pathogenic within these genes. They can be binned into these classes of uh, tumor, tumor predisposition genes, um, BRCA1 and 2, probably the best known uh, genes for leaf Fraumini syndrome, various forms of Lynch syndrome, and then a variety of other probably less common disorders associated with tumor predisposition. There are a set of genes associated with connective tissue dysplasia. The reason for those being on the list is they can present with a sudden death potentially due to aortic dissection. A set of genes associated with cardiomyopathy or cardiac arrhythmia. A few metabolic disorders, including hypercholesterolemia. One might imagine that that's easily diagnosed by testing cholesterol, but in fact, um, identifying an individual at genetic risk can sometimes predate the identification um, through cholesterol testing. And then two genes associated with malignant hyperthermia, probably the one pharmacogenetic variant or one set of pharmacogenetic variants on this list because of the risk of very severe adverse reactions to specific anesthetic agents. You know, need to remember that this list, first of all, is a kind of a living document. There continues to be a committee considering addition or potentially even removal of genes from this list. And so it's likely that this list will change over time. And uh, our plan is to sort of keep up with it as we go forward. And again, to emphasize, this was really not put together specific to population screening or to research, but we felt it was a reasonably well-vetted list of disorders that would be of value to participants if these results were returned. The communications that take place within this program are both to participants and to providers. Participants, of course, will um, be informed about the study and asked to provide informed consent. They have various opt-in options, including to receive the results, to have the results shared with their primary care provider. 
and also to participate in the DNA uh, bank and database. Um, those that opt in will receive either a positive or negative report. I'll say more about that in a moment. If a positive finding occurs, genetic counseling is offered. We do offer telemedicine counseling for individuals realizing it's a pretty large state and won't always be convenient for people to come to Birmingham or Huntsville, uh, which is where our kind of main operations are located. Providers get a CME program, which we hope will help them understand better how genomics can be used in their practice. If the participant has opted in to providing a report to the provider, this is then sent to them. And we do offer point of care support when a positive result has been returned. These are two posters that have been prepared, which gives you an idea of the kind of information that is provided to the population. It shows um, first some of the contact information. And individuals now can sign up um, through our website to participate in the program. And this gives a very quick um, rundown of the basic sort of nuts and bolts of the program um, to enroll um, through a blood sample um, that is obtained. And um, then the DNA is extracted and tested. Those that are found to carry a actionable result will be provided counseling. And then there is a research component of this uh, that individuals can opt into as well. These are two pictures of the enrollment team and um, a table set up right outside the phlebotomy area in the Kirkland Clinic, which is the main outpatient clinic at UAB. Uh, Medical Towers is a research facility at UAB. And <clears throat> we're in process of expanding recruitment to various other sites, especially Huntsville, Montgomery, and Selma. And we're also setting up pop-up clinics around the state. We actually did one uh, about a month, I said, I'd say, ago um, at the state house um, to give um, state legislators and staff an opportunity to enroll if they're interested. Um, and um, we also have um, a variety of outreach activities, including participant stories, both in video and print form. There is a formal participant engagement process. Uh, Dr. Sarah Knight is the leader of that effort. It includes these three components, um, an advisory committee consisting of various stakeholders, including participants, clinicians, health system executives, and community leaders um, that meet on a regular basis and provide ongoing feedback. There are a set of structured key informant interviews um, through communities in the region and then a facilitated deliberative process where both our findings and our approaches to enrollment are reviewed. And this is intended to be kind of a way of getting feedback on whether the way we're doing this is most appropriate for the community. Uh, Dr. Stephen Shodake from Tuskegee University has also been a consultant to the process to help us to be sure that we're doing things in a culturally sensitive way in the community. So as mentioned, uh, we're in process of expanding this to multiple sites, um, also Mobile, Alabama, through the University of South Alabama um, are uh, intended to be brought into the program. And really one of the main reasons for doing this is to maximize the diversity of participants, realizing it's a relatively large state. And we certainly can't expect people to drive across the state to Birmingham to participate. And so we're trying our best to make this as broadly available as we can. This is a breakdown of the enrollment so far, and it compares it to um, US Census. And I won't go through every number on this um, table. I realize it's a busy table, um, but our fundamental goal is to try our best to um, reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of the state and to try to engage people across as broad a population as possible. And as is obvious here, we have a ways to go. We are nowhere close to um, having recruited um, 
individuals, for example, from the African-American population in proportion to their representation in the state. We, we certainly recognize that, and that's one of the major motivations for us to be expanding our enrollment beyond Birmingham into areas of the state um, where um, some of the um, populations that might otherwise um, be at risk of um, not participating are most likely to get their medical care and hopefully to be willing to participate. We also are aware that um, we have a, a higher proportion of female than male participants, another thing that we're trying to address. We have done a kind of rough ancestry analysis. It's a somewhat hard thing to see, but the um, plus symbols are participants in this principal components analysis from our study and the dots are showing um, populations of various components. And, and we have sampled pretty broad diversity of populations, uh, but not yet to the numbers that we really know that we need to achieve. If you look at the age breakdown, and this is looking over last year's time, we haven't um, analyzed the data so far from this year. Um, the peak age, as you can see, is from about 50 to 70. And I think that may reflect in part um, the phenomenon of beginning the recruitment in a medical outpatient clinic. And that also reflects what I think is probably happening for many people is that they do see value in the return of results, but they see it as much for their families as for themselves. So let me show you a little bit about the progress that has been made so far. Um, if we focus first on the population cohort, um, as of within the last few weeks, 1,500 approximately have been enrolled. Um, most, not quite all of those, have gone all the way through the analytic pipeline. And so far, pathogenic or likely pathogenic, actually, variants have been confirmed in 15, and we have verification in process for an additional 12. So that means potentially 27 variants um, confirmed. It may be fewer um, in the event that some of the ones that are in process of verification do not verify. Um, so at least 15, possibly as many as 27. And if you look at that from the perspective of percentages, um, if it's only 15, that would be a 1% rate of return. And if um, all 27 verify, it would be about a 1.8% rate of return. This is in range for what we anticipated. Um, we originally were estimating between one and 3% of participants would have a return of results of a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in one of the ACMG 59 genes. We knew that we were under ascertaining variants because the global screening array does not pick up all possible pathogenic variants. So we think we're actually just about where we predicted we would be um, based on the experience with other studies that we used to estimate these numbers. Now here's the same list I showed you a few minutes ago but now I've highlighted in red the examples of genes where there have been confirmed pathogenic or likely pathogenic findings. Now, these numbers are not as large as the numbers I showed you just a minute ago, and the reason is there have been several examples of multiple um, findings in the same gene in different individuals. Um, so in other words, some of these genes are counted more than one time. That's not indicated on the slide. Uh, but as you can see, we've had both BRCA1 and 2, um, MLH1, a few genes uh, for cardiomyopathy, um, several for hypercholesterolemia, and a couple actually for malignant hyperthermia. And this is actually just looking at the confirmed ones, doesn't count the list of others that are in process currently of being verified. Now, what you're looking at here is a screenshot of just one paragraph from a negative return of results notification. Um, so anybody who participates and opts in for testing will get a letter back that tells them that either we didn't find anything that we believe to be pathogenic or likely pathogenic or that we did. The area that we've been most concerned about 
is in what I guess you could describe as false reassurance from a negative result. Honestly, it's, it's of course, not easy to return a positive result to somebody because it, it has significant medical implications. But in some ways, it's straightforward because it's the kind of thing we do all the time, and people are doing this in the hope that they will learn something. Not They don't want, of course, to have an abnormal result, but they're doing it because if they did, they want to know it. Um, our biggest worry is that people will overinterpret a negative result. And first of all, it could be interpreted by them to imply that if we didn't find anything, they must have a clean bill of health, maybe in general, or maybe just for the genes in question. And neither of those is true. As I'm sure you'll recognize, um, when we're testing only a small subset of genes, many, many different kinds of genetic conditions are not included, first of all. And second of all, um, the coverage of variants, even in the genes we're testing, is not 100%. And one of the important points that we make in the consent process, in the education and outreach process, and in the return to results process, is that if you have any clinical indication for being tested, for example, a family history of cancer might be such an indication, or personal history even, the AGHI is not the place to go to get clinical testing. It might seem attractive because it's done free of charge, but it's not a good idea because this is nowhere near as good coverage as would be offered if clinical testing were done. So we've settled on this um, wording. Um, in the set of genes tested, we did not find any gene differences or changes that have been linked to a high risk to develop a disease. However, this does not mean that you will not develop any disease in the future. It also does not rule out having a genetic risk factor for disease, even in the genes we tested. Um, so this is an area that you know, we're definitely concerned about. Another point relevant to this is how often do people choose to share information with their primary care provider? And this is at the time of initial consent. This surprised us a little bit, um, although in retrospect, maybe it's not that surprising. Um, only half have consented to share the results with their provider. And we think the reason why is that they want to manage those results at their discretion. And in particular, I guess, if there's a positive result, they want the opportunity to think this through and, and then um, to share it under, um, you know, sort of in their own time and in their own way. I can tell you that if somebody has a positive result, we counsel them and we'll definitely encourage them to connect with a health provider who can work with them on a risk sort of management protocol. And usually that will eventually involve sharing it with a provider, uh, but many prefer to defer that decision until after they get a result. Meanwhile, 93%, as of the end of last year at least, had consented for their DNA to be saved in the biobank. So there was a very high uptake of interest in that. Back to the point about concerns about people over-interpreting the data. We also collect some basic family history information that is reviewed by a team of genetic counselors on all participants. And they are specifically reviewing these to determine if there are red flags in the family history that might suggest a familial risk and therefore that the individual would benefit from a more formal medical genetics consultation and if appropriate from for um, regular clinical genetic testing. So in looking at the individuals over this um, 1,500 or so who have been recruited so far, 51%, so touch over half, um, had no findings based on the family history they provided that would have prompted us to suggest a genetics consultation. About 5%, it wasn't clear cut, but there was enough suggestion that it was thought worth mentioning to them. And a surprisingly large number, 44%, uh, there was recommended additional genetics consultation uh, because there was information in the family history that suggested the possibility of a genetic 
etiology uh, for one of these disorders in spite of the negative test with the, uh, the global screening array. So it's a pretty reasonable number. And I guess, you know, one question that's too soon to judge is how often will these individuals actually seek formal genetics consultation? That's one of the questions we'll be studying. We know that some for sure have, but we don't know yet how many have. And again, this becomes a kind of teachable moment for the community to get their attention and recognize the um, potential power of review of the family history. Turning attention now to the whole genome sequencing, 37 probands have been enrolled, 32 of these had completed their sequencing. That doesn't mean 37 sequences because many of these are trios of a parent, uh, I'm sorry, of a child and both parents. But in any case, 37 probands, 32 have been um, fully analyzed. As it stands right now, eight, I'm sorry, 11, 11 had reportable findings, eight variants of unknown significance, four likely pathogenic, one pathogenic. Now these numbers may not seem entirely line up because uh, we've had one that was a secondary finding also from the ACMG 59 list. So not a diagnosis that explained the phenotype, but a secondary finding in somebody who had opted in to receiving those. And there were two individuals with two, what we would describe as primary findings that we believe are related to the underlying phenotype. And that's why um, there's more findings um, individually than um, individuals who had reportable findings. Well, we're into the second year and well into it at this point. And I've mentioned already some of our goals, um, one to expand enrollment, particularly to areas of the state uh, where we believe individuals who might otherwise be at risk of being underrepresented in biomedical research will have a chance to participate. Um, we very much do want to reflect the demographics of the population in our state. Uh, we actually have recorded now um, some originally um, podcasts and soon videos on genomic medicine, which is intended for continuing medical education through the UAB MD Learning Channel. Our community engagement efforts continue, and similarly, our biobanking efforts continue. And in fact, we'll be having a symposium um, in just a few weeks, which is an annual event uh, between UAB and Hudson Alpha, and formulating working groups there um, to look at um, both population, functional genomics, and um, then um, the sort of common disorders and um, ethical, legal, and social implications that uh, can be studied based on this cohort. So let me just broadly mention a few kind of lessons that we feel we've learned um, over the course of time. Uh, the first concerns um, what I guess could be considered the value of participation from the perspective of participants. And it's very clear from um, the feedback we've gotten that people are highly motivated to participate in this and they really do value the opportunity to get return of results, even realizing many of the limitations that are clearly delineated in the informed consent document, including, by the way, uncertainty about pathogen, about, excuse me, about penetrance in different populations. We've talked about adding other things, ancestry data, carrier status, and pharmacogenetic data. That hasn't happened just yet um, and remains to be seen whether we will. The ancestry return is, we think, not a straightforward thing because I'm creating a really user-friendly portal for informing individuals about their ancestry. is is not a particularly straightforward application. Uh, we have discussed the possibility of partnering with groups that have invested heavily in um, putting together very user-friendly ancestry-related interfaces. We haven't returned carrier status, um, partly because uh, we're not sure that that will be as motivating and partly because the counseling requirements could become um, much greater given uh, essentially everybody or a very high proportion of people will be a carrier for something. 
Uh, we also haven't yet returned pharmacogenetic data except for the malignant hypothermia risks. I think the reason here is that the infrastructure in the state for physicians to manage pharmacogenetic data really needs first to be built out. Um, if a person is found to be a carrier, let's suppose for a BRCA variant that's known to be pathogenic, and this is an adult, um, that individual is going to be offered a program for surveillance right then and there, and it will begin since they're adults um, at that point in time. For pharmacogenetic data, they may or may not currently be on a medication that's relevant to whatever the variant is that's been found. And we worry a little bit that it could be years, even decades before that time would come. And we're not so sure that the systems are in place yet to guarantee that those results will be available when and where they're needed. Um, that's something we're actually working on and hope at some point that we'll be able to add pharmacogenetic data, maybe by returning it directly to the participant and giving them a card of some sort that they can show to their provider if they ever need to be put on a medication. Second are some of the concerns, and I've alluded to those. One that we're very um, anxious to work out is to make sure that we really are recruiting a diverse population. Again, that reflects the state. The obvious um, issue here is um, exacerbation of health disparities. And that's something we're exceedingly eager to avoid. We have worked hard to, um, first of all, do outreach into the larger population, and secondly, to um, be sure that we're doing this in a culturally sensitive way. Um, the issue of clinical versus research testing, I've also alluded to, we, we really want to make sure that nobody mistakes this for clinical testing. They will get clinical grade return of results if something is found, but a negative finding here should not be taken as a clean bill of health, even for the genes that we evaluated. And achieving numbers, you know, actually so far our experience has been um, pretty positive that not been that difficult to um, get people to be interested in this study. And um, if anything, we're concerned that we may reach a point where uh, we won't be able to recruit all the people who might be interested. And finally, from the point of view of impact, um, we think this has the opportunity to raise public awareness for genomics. Um, we likewise see it as a kind of teachable moment for the provider population as well as for the general population. To some extent, um, this may be helpful as what could be thought of as a model to test some of the uh, kinds of approaches to population screening in a state um, that has more than its share of medical problems and, and plenty of opportunity to try to do good to enhance the health of our population. So I'm going to end at that. There are many, many people, not all of whom could be named on this slide, who have helped us um, to um, get this program off the ground and to keep it flying. Uh, Rini Moss is the program director who really is um, a person that coordinates um, a complex kind of show. I won't name everybody, but we have a team of genetic counselors, both at UAB and Hudson Alpha. Um, Greg Cooper and his team have been uh, doing the genomic analysis, both for genotyping and um, for whole genome sequencing at Hudson Alpha. Um, the enrollment has um, been spearheaded by uh, Mona Fuad and her team, and um, William Curry has really been instrumental in helping us um, get outreach to the primary care community. Uh, Jim Semino has been um, in charge of our informatics efforts, and Jeff Edberg, the biobanking. I mentioned uh, Sarah Knight and Dr. Shodike and participant engagement. We have, as you can see, a bioethics team, and um, my co-PIs, Matt Might and Greg Barsh. And with that, I will conclude, and we'll be very happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Kaur, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. 
will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. The first question is, do you recruit both children and adults to both the population and the affected cohorts? We are only recruiting adults who can provide informed consent to the population cohort. Uh, we're at this point not comfortable on a population screening basis to return results of adult onset disorders to children. Now, that's a little different than when this is done as an incidental finding in diagnostic testing where it is offered to children. But to do this on a screening basis, we didn't think that was appropriate, at least not right now. Um, certainly something we can rethink over time. But so the population cohort are only for adults. In contrast, the affected cohort, individuals who have a phenotype that hasn't been diagnosed so far, um, this does include both children and adults. Obviously, um, the parents are asked to provide consent, and if possible, the child to provide assent. Um, but that affected cohort are individuals uh, at any age. Thank you. What kind of information do you collect about family and medical history from participants in the population cohort? Right now, the population cohort um, includes a questionnaire that targets the kind of family history that might be related to the 59 genes that we're testing. Uh, so specifically questions about individual or family history of various forms of cancer, of cardiovascular disease, of sudden death, of um, adverse reaction, anesthesia, hypercholesterolemia, things of that sort. Um, we do have, for those that opt in, the opportunity to link to an electronic health record if it's available. And that provides a much broader access to medical information. But what we specifically ask, we've tried to keep it relatively simple and not so time consuming. It's really meant to flag individuals who would benefit from standard genetic testing and not to have them be sort of lulled into complacency that a no return of results from AGHI means they don't have a genetic disorder. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, th those are all reviewed by our team of genetic counselors and many of them will get a letter saying that there are some red flags here that might benefit you to follow up. Thank you. For the population cohort, do you plan to reanalyze data in the future and recontact participants if new information is available? This is a really important issue, and the answer actually is no, we don't. Um, it's certainly possible, I guess you could say even probable, that over the course of time, a variant will be reclassified. We may learn that things that were not thought to be pathogenic could be discovered to be pathogenic. It could, in theory, go the other way, I suppose, too, although it's likely, I think. Um, Furthermore, the ACMG list may be expanded, or at some point we may decide on our own to expand the list. And so the person who was tested, say, for the 59 genes, two or three years from now, maybe we'll be testing 75 genes, and those wouldn't have been covered originally. But in the consent process, we make it clear that we're really not set up to be able to do that kind of recontact. Because this is a population-wide cohort, we have no way of being sure that we'll be able to find individuals a year or two out. We are not necessarily providing their health care. And our concern was if we made a promise to do that, uh, there could be many instances where we would find it very difficult to locate people and um, it didn't seem appropriate. So what we say instead is that anybody who participates is invited to recontact us if they would like to ask the question, is there anything new? And if they do, then we are prepared to do reanalysis. But it really needs to be initiated by them because otherwise we're afraid that we'll set up expectations that are just impossible for us to um, sort of maintain. Right. Thank you. How do you decide whom to sequence in the affected cohort? There's a set of criteria that we use to determine eligibility for sequencing in the affected cohort. It includes the kind of things a medical geneticist might look for in an individual with a complex phenotype, um, multi-system signs, 
synchronicity. Um, of course, family history would be a strong indicator, although we realize many of these issues will be de novo. Um, so it's not, it's not an algorithm that's cast in stone. It's, it's a judgment. We actually have a committee that reviews the case histories of individuals who are identified usually through their primary care doctors or through the UAB Undiagnosed Diseases Program or in um, Huntsville at the um, Hudson Alpha Smith Family Clinic. And if they're individuals deemed to be um, potentially eligible for screening, we have a team of medical geneticists to review the clinical history and the family history and um, we'll make a decision as to whether an individual is likely to benefit and then be offered sequencing. Thank you. We have time for one more question. How are family members informed of potential risk if an individual in the population cohort receives the result of a pathogenic variant? We don't have um, on our own the ability to directly contact family members due to the obvious privacy and consent issues. Um, so our only kind of line of communication is directly to the participant. However, anybody who receives a return of results that indicates a potentially pathogenic variant is provided or at least offered genetic counseling, either by phone, telemedicine, or in person. And of course, there we will emphasize the importance of notifying relatives if it's a trait, which it often will be, that could affect other members of the family. A high proportion of these are dominant and it may very well be a family history, known or unknown to the participant at that point in time. So we, we obviously can't go around the participant to directly notify family members, but we educate the participant. And we also are prepared to sort of um, arm them, if you will, with information that they can use to identify relatives and provide them, for example, we'll provide them a letter that explains what's been found that they can give to a relative with contact information for how they can get in touch with us or a local genetic counselor or medical geneticist perhaps to have further testing. So um, that's an important point we recognize. and It has to be done sensitively and with um, respect for the privacy of the individual, but we certainly do educate them and try as best we can to facilitate well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Korf for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 10th, 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.